guys. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back again to my YouTube podcast. On the line, I have Dr. Eric uh, Block and uh, Charles Dure, both of my uh, uh, guests today. And uh, I'm honored and uh, really a, a privilege to introduce both of them. Uh, Eric, uh, Dr. Block, is going to be talking about his book today. So before I, in, I continue, uh, I'd like uh, you guys just uh, introduce yourself a little bit and uh, let's get start the journey today. Well, the privilege is all mine and yours and Eric's. Uh, it's nice to have this synergy and get together. And so the privilege, even though you said it's yours, it's really mine. And being here with Eric and you both, I think great people attract great people. So I'm blessed to be able to be here today with you. And uh, thank you. And thank you for the invitation uh, from both you and Eric. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Eric Block, please uh, tell us how long you've been practicing and your journey. We'd like to know more about the book that you wrote. It's called the... How to live a free, uh, stress life at the dentist. That's that's something everyone will know. All of us have issues. So let's talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, so I'll give you the quick uh, uh, elevator, uh, you know, delivery of my story. I'm, I've been practicing 20 years and I actually didn't go to, I went to Tulane. I didn't go to Tulane thinking I was going to be applying to dental school. And I actually one night broke my front tooth, my number nine central incisor. And the next day, the local dentist in, in Louisiana, they just took care of me. And I said, you know what? Maybe this is something I could do. So I applied to Nova Southeastern and I went to dental school in Fort Lauderdale from 98 to 02. And then I did an implant residency at BU. And that's what brought me back to Massachusetts. And I was there from 02 to 04. And I've been practicing about 20 years, about 30 minutes west of Boston. Um, about halfway through my career, I went through a tremendous amount of burnout and stress and anxiety yeah, to the point where I actually thought about leaving dentistry to go to law school because I was so nervous about yeah. getting sued that I actually wanted to flip the script so I could be the one doing the suing. That's how nervous I was. And I, it was all up here. And I actually picked up the phone and I called a local therapist and I started going through therapy and really digging into why I was so anxious and nervous and stressed. And it was, it was all just me putting too much pressure on myself. Right. And I really started to make some changes and I just stopped putting less stress on myself. And I started focusing in on, you know, the, the 30 good things that happened in the day and not the one bad thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And I stopped focusing on, on getting a bad review or uh, if a margin broke or, or mm -hmm. a, a patient wasn't happy, you know, cause these things happen to every dentist every day. And it's happened to every dentist in the history of dentistry. So, you know, to not put too much pressure on ourselves. So I actually wrote a book called the stress-free dentist. And it was really just, a, I wanted to share my story of how I overcame burnout and actually how I enjoy going into work every day. And I felt like if I could do it, then anyone could do it. And it's, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It was a lot of work and I really had to reach out for a lot of help. Uh, and then in uh, 2022, I wrote my second book called Stress-Free Dental Implants. And that's all about my 20-year journey with dental implants and really just how to add uh, a new treatment modality like dental implants to your practice. And then this past year, I wrote The Stress-Free Entrepreneur, which it totally sounds oxymoronic. Yeah. And yeah. even even The Stress-Free Dentist sounds oxymoronic, but it's a mindset where you know there's going to be a tremendous amount of stress you know there's going to be failure. You know there's going to be mistakes, but you don't let it break you. And that's really why I wrote the book. Awesome. The, it seems like all of uh, three of us actually been practicing more than 20 years. So with the, uh, the way that we all went through with, uh, after the first half, 10 year, and, and then how we change from, we make the determination what we're going to do the other 10 year. So the, all of us have the 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 uh, roadblock that we go get to where we are, and then we just change it. So it's beautiful that uh, at, after twenty years, you know, you figure out who you are and what exactly you want to do fit with your career. And uh, so, uh, Charles, uh, what in your mind uh, about what we uh, discussed so far? It is a mindset, and I think uh, thank you for being transparent, Eric. I think that's part of your beauty. These are transparent and real and authentic, okay? And uh, not everybody is. So you just share with the story that you're burnt out, that you thought about going to law school and all this sort of stuff. And it, it's a reality. It's not an easy job. It's 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 the jack of all trades, master of many, right? And it's not master of none, right? You have to wear a hat. You have to be a manager. You have to be 
a business person, you have to be a clinician, you, it's it's psychologist. I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. And plus not everything's being taught at the school. Communicate, you got to commute with your team. You got to be a leader. You have to do business, everything, all those aspects, right? It's not easy. And we are perfectionists, right? They're trained as perfectionists. The, the reason there's no perfection that exists. It's only excellence. We can only achieve excellence. There's only one perfection in the world or one thing that may be close to perfection, right? You can go there, but literally it's hard to attain those things. I think you would agree, Eric, and we're, the, we're our worst enemies. And so you're talking about mindset, aren't you? Lateral growth, mindset, positive mental attitude. Yeah, right. and actually one of the, the biggest stresses for me was going from room to room to room and, you know, I'd be focusing on a patient for half an hour and really just focused on that one millimeter space. And I'd get up and go to the next room and yeah. have to put on an act like okay. always, in, always in a great mood because yeah. no patient wants a tired, sad dentist working on them. Yeah. And that would happen, you know, over and over and over again. And I understood through my you know sessions with therapy that I am more introverted. So I thought there was something wrong with me and I was getting exhausted by the end of the day from these, uh, the, the social interactions with patients. And it got to the point where I said, you know what, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just the way you're wired and it is exhausting. And there's going to be days where I get home and I'm totally junk, uh, but that's okay. You know, I'm going to get back the next day and I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself. And that's was really a major breakthrough for me. 100%. I, I see that um, it is a uh, something that you have to mentally change every day, your mindset. And to go from a screaming kid, you're doing pedo on or an endo, you're deep in to that. It's kind of nice to take breaks, to tell you the truth, because sometimes you break and you're like, it gives me a little mental clarity to go back in. Right. And now it's it's a whole you get a whole new perspective. It's nice. But at the same time, you may be doing sedation case or nitrous and you're worrying about your assistant, making sure she's taking care of that patient. So it is a juggle. It's a juggle. Right. We juggle, you know, so Eric, have, so, so case on. can you go back a little bit like during the, the periods where you were just completely burned out? Uh, did you do so much? Uh, big case or would you focus on something so big that uh, it uh, it was just overwhelming with so much uh, like post-op care from patient what were the things that you said stressed the most like was it the patient care or management care or, or what was that that really burn make you burn out yeah it was really all the above and you know it got to the point where i couldn't wait until five o'clock so i could go home I couldn't wait until the weekend so I could decompress from the week. I, I couldn't wait until I retired, you know, so I wouldn't have to do this anymore. And even yeah. I couldn't wait until lunch so I could go home for an hour. <laughs> and it was it was the uh, social interaction. It was the putting too much pressure on myself, trying to be perfect. And I was also trying to be everything to everyone. I was saying yes to everyone. Yeah. I would treat any case and any patient. And a lot of times that would burn me. And I I, I realized that, you know, me saying yes to everyone else was like me saying no to myself. And ultimately I learned, and I do this very nicely, but there's, there's patients and there's cases that I don't want to take on. I, I understand my comfort zone now and I'll tell the patient that, you know what, I'm going to, this is a little out of my comfort zone. I'm going to refer you to a colleague. So I'm not saying yes to everyone. I'm saying no occasionally. And that's like saying yes to myself. How about empathy, Eric? How about empathy? Did you did you internalize those things on an empathetic level or sympathetic level with patients? Absolutely, I, I did. You, you know, you stand upon that a little bit. Oh sure, I've had patients cry in my on my chair. I've had staff cry, and it's it's in. a it's a grind. You know, it's it's difficult because you, no one wants a, a patient to cry or a staff member cry. And the, we go. Th it, dentistry is such a complex profession. It's really hard to explain to someone that is not uh, in the dental industry. You know, we we deal with, you know, we're clinicians. Like like you mentioned, all of these things that we do and these hats that we wear. We're clinicians. We're CEOs. We're we're marketers. We're all of a sudden uh, leaders of a of a oh. business, and we had absolutely no training in any of this. No. And we're expected to know the answers. And I, I really internalized that a lot. And it's okay to say I don't know. And right. it's okay to to tell patients or staff that I, I don't know. Um, so yes, I, I did internalize a lot of that. And again, that was just me being too hard on myself. How do you flick the switch, Eric? 
Oh, tell us the secret sauce. What did you do? Yeah, it's you know for me it was it was it was going every two weeks to a therapist, a uh, combination of prescribed medications, and it took a while. Make no mistake, it did not happen overnight. And no, no, no. I just started making changes. I started, um, you know, we we moved on from some staff. Uh, I started not beating myself up. I would focus more on the good things that happened. And there's sure there's still days where I get home and I'm totally exhausted, right, right. but I understand that that is so common, you know, as, as dentists, we walk, we live these parallel lives and I really found it so helpful to reach out to mentors, to peers, to uh, coaches, consultants, and um, to not go in on this profession alone. Yeah. You were not, you're, 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 you were on an Island right before, and you decided to get a boat and get a crew. And get off yeah, the yeah. Right? that's great. I like I that. Like metaphors and analogy. Sorry, <laughs> that's what yeah, I do. That's good. Okay, but um, but right, that's that's what you did. Mm -hmm. Yep. You, you said I'm not alone, and you got everybody needs a coach, right, Eric? I mean, you have coaches. You probably mentor people too. You do both, right? So this this hurts me to say because he left New England, but Tom Brady went to Tampa Bay, right? <laughs> Tom Brady, and this hurts me to say, uh, he's the greatest quarterback that ever lived. He has a throwing coach. Now it's it's no. not to get it's not to get one percent better, it's to get 0.01 percent better. So everyone has a coach or should True. get a coach. True. Yeah, Even Tiger Woods, coach. right? Tiger Woods has the guy that puts the ball that just sits there and puts the ball on yep. every time. And that guy's coaching him. He's watching it from a minutia, not just the whole swing. He's watching it from a little micro level. Yeah. Kind of what you said, right? Everybody needs a broad perspective of information. We see with their own eyes and hear with their own ears, but we don't always. I mean, look, right? We don't we don't always see everything. We can't see everything. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, do do you do um, all kind of dentistry, or you focus only in implant dentistry right now? Great question, and I think that's another reason why I enjoy going to work every day. Is I've okay. added new treatment modalities uh, for the past few years, so <laughs> as well as new technology and. I, I think when you add new treatments or technology, you re-energize yourself mm -hmm. and you look forward to going into work every day. So I've been doing implants for 20 years and initially they were one of the most stressful things I did all day because I was planning on 2D technology and freehanding surgery. And then when I switched to 3D technology and, and guided surgery, they became one of the most enjoyable procedures I did all day. And that's what I write a, a lot about in, in my second book. But I've also added clear liners. I'm starting to add sleep and airway. We added 3D printing. We went fully digital uh, with a with a scanner. And every time you add something like this, it really energizes you. It energizes the staff. And it also, you know, who else sees it is the patients. They are wowed by uh, technology. They're wowed by when you invest in in their care. We we added artificial intelligence uh, this this past uh, quarter. Uh, so I, I really look forward to to adding all of these things. So do you feel a, uh, the future of dentistry for our uh, kid, our son and daughter generation are going to be much different than what we are practicing? Or you think this is, we are actually right where we they going to be? And what do you think the future of dentistry and how do you feel like uh, are those kids that graduate gonna uh, might be suffer the same way we suffer, or maybe or maybe they have better chance of using technology to to make their dentistry life uh, and this life easier? What do you think? Oh, for sure. I, I think that the, the technology is so much better, but also the resources. You know, when I first got out of school, I kept in touch with uh, you know a few classmates, and that was really my my peer engagement. There, there wasn't YouTube back then. There wasn't all these great Facebook groups. There, you know, the 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 young dentists getting out now have so many resources at their fingertips that they can reach out to, and they really should. Uh, and also, I've I've developed the the International Academy of Dental Life Coaches here uh, for co for dentists or dental professionals, hygienists as well that may be feeling burned out to to give them a place to go to to get matched up with a life coach because. You know, again, you should not go into this profession alone. The technology is awesome. Uh, I think it's just going to keep getting better and better. And, you know, personally, I I couldn't imagine going back to taking analog impressions. Uh, I I you know, there, when you start to add new technology and new treatments, you just keep staying up with with the trends, and you got to keep reinventing yourself. 
Um, so I think the technology and dentistry is just going to keep keep on going. Uh, I, I feel like at some point, you know, when you're working on a a, a type of don in, in school, it's eventually going to go to like VR where you're actually pretending you. like you're drilling in a patient's mouth or placing an implant in a patient's mouth and it's going to feel so real. I, I think it's just going to keep getting better and better. It's already here. Yeah. Systems has it. It's haptic technology. And uh, so it's already here. We're actually doing uh, like flight simulators for airplanes. We're doing the mm. same thing with dentistry. And we're actually getting board approval too. So board approval as well. So real test cases before you see the patient, which is amazing, right, Eric? Let's see That's if awesome. a complicated case. You can actually print it and do it in real time before mm -hmm. the patient comes in. So Eric, so let's say um, somebody first came out from school versus somebody practicing 10 year and versus somebody practicing 20 year. Do you think that they need the life, each of these group of people uh, need the different set of uh, coach because some of the, them just need to how to start their career. Some of them want to make their career better. Somebody want to even more establish more passive income. So do you agree that each of these group of uh, dentists should be having a separate type of coach in a, for, 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 for their pathway or they can just get the quote the, co the coach who coach who can coach from everything what do you think about just the, in general just give us some advice some of those listeners they want to thinking like man I, I'm I just thought out only three years why do I want to listen to this guy you know or or thing like that so yeah you know for me it was therapy and coaching and for you know anyone listening out there it could be reaching out to a peer group you know engaging on Facebook a, a, a mentor a consultant whatever it takes to to get the help that you need but you know, personally, one of my regrets is that I didn't reach out for help sooner. And I, you know, picture like you're pushing a, a a beach ball under the water, and you keep pushing it down. Uh, eventually, that that beach ball is going to burst up out of the water. And when you when you don't do anything about it, you know, these a lot of these problems, these stresses, they're not going to go away on their own. It magically doesn't happen, and they just compound and build up. And eventually, that leads to burnout and stress, depression, suicide, uh, drug abuse. You name it, it can it can happen, and it is real. Um, so you know, to all the the young dental professionals out there, seek help quickly because think about how we explain to a patient how this cavity is going to get bigger and bigger. If you don't treat it, it's going to turn into a crown. If you don't, if you still don't treat it, it's going to end up in a root canal. And if you still don't treat it, it could end up to the point where you have to extract it and and do an implant. So we tell patients not to wait. You know. For us, we should do the same thing. Don't wait, uh, because if you do, these these issues get bigger and bigger and harder to solve. So, are you, when you're saying that, uh, are you talking about uh, uh, looking for looking out for a dental consultant or looking out for the uh, mental health therapist, or we, it might be both? Is that both? Yeah, whatever it takes. You know, and you know, I had a really great group of peers when I first got out of school. And that was like, every time I get off the, th the phone, it was like a therapy session because, you know, we live these, we live these parallel lives. And a lot of times as solo practitioners, we're in our own little bubble and we go to work and we, we go home and we don't reach out. But when you do reach out and you understand that a lot of dentists are going through the same exact thing you are, it's, it's such a relief, but again, it's whether it's a peer, a mentor, a consultant, a coach, a therapist, uh, find out what works for you and, and and dive in and and you may not find out that the first thing you try works for you. It may take many, many coaches, many consultants, many therapists, many peers, uh, but just keep trying because if you don't, uh, very rarely does a dentist with issues all of a sudden just get better on 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 their own. So uh, that's that's my advice. I agree. I agree. Um, Charo, any uh, add in? I think it's multifactorial. I think that you need to have a personal coach. You have to have a business coach. You have to have a technology coach. You got to, I think you need to be coached. And I think it's really helpful when you can symbiotically do it with each other. But I think that a mutually beneficial mentorship, when you have like what we're doing right now, this is an engaging dialogue. Okay. It's active. It's, it's learning from each other. That's what it's all about. It's not like one person superior over the other. It's like, we all have different experiences and different cultures and different backgrounds. I think it's beautiful. I think that more people need to help each other and just give. The more you give, the more you receive. Okay? And I, that, so I think to answer your question, look, it's not just 
one everybody's good at one particular some if your niche is right there's a coach you got to have a dental coach right you got to have maybe a personal coach depending on what's going on in your life mm -hmm. maybe you have a technology coach you go to spears you go to panky you can immerse yourself in technology right you can't just pick up technology and make it work i mean maybe you're self-studied but most people have to go and see it breathe it live it love it you know uh go to panky i would encourage everybody to go to panky which is well-rounded place or spears or Coise, or wherever you go, just immerse yourself in technology and mentorship, personally, business-wise, and technology, and just seek people even outside of this field of dentistry. It doesn't even have to be in dentistry, right? I think that's what you do, right? You're saying, by the way, I love what you're doing, Eric, to have International Academy of Dental Life Coaching. I think that's beautiful. That's a purpose-driven company, correct? Mm -hmm. It is. Company. Yep. It's about people, purpose, passion, people. So I think so. That's gonna. That's amazing here. I, I love that you did that. By the way, I commend you on that. Tell tell us about a little bit about the international uh, coaching uh, uh, that you have, right? Uh, how long have you established this? Yeah, we actually launched about a month ago, and it's a group of of coaches. It, it's a broad range of coaches, from hygienists to dentists to uh, uh, life coaches that have been experienced with dental assisting, even admin. We've got a broad range, so anyone that is in the dental field you will be able to reach out to a life coach that understands dentistry. And one of the reasons I founded it, uh, I have a co-founder, Dr. Laura Brenner. And, you know, when I was going through my own personal therapy, I just picked up the phone and I called a local therapist here and she, she was excellent, but she did not understand the complexities of the yeah. dental industry. And I would go on this long winded rant about the hygienist and the front desk and the assistants. And after 20 minutes, she would say, so what does the hygienist do again? And I'd be like, <laughs> oh, you know, I just went through this long-winded rant. So we wanted a place for people to go and get matched up with a life coach that understands dentistry. Uh, right. So that's that's one of the reasons. And that's phase one. Phase two is we're going to actually be training dental professionals who are looking for a either a side career or a full career change nice to too. become a life coach. So we're going to get involved with a, a life coaching credentialing program. Wonderful. So um, coming up soon then. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, in general, I see that you have a lot of certificate or of credential uh, uh, behind your name. Can you tell the young dentist whether you encourage them to get as much at credential as possible or focus on something that uh, because we really don't know. Sometimes we don't really know which one we, would we go. So what is your recommendation in terms of achieve higher education or focus on something uh, or what what your best uh, advice for those young dentists that looking out for looking at us they you know all of us have several, several clients or behind and they don't really know who to follow it's <clears throat> a really good question yeah so uh, that's an excellent question and i think that when you my advice if i could go back you know like in back to the future you know step on the pedal go 88 miles per hour in the delorean and go back in the future and tell myself what, what to do differently, I would tell a young blocky to go out there and, and associate for a couple of years, learn in different styles of practice from different types of practices, yeah. whether it's rural, urban, suburban, high volume, you know, boutique style, you know, get different, different styles and different cultures and then mold them to your own. And then I would have gone out there and, and bought my own practice. I, I associated for 10 years. And for me, that was looking back was way too long. And I just got comfortable as an associate. But you know, I went out immediately after dental school and, and did an implant residency and then got my fellowship in the International Congress of Oral Plantologists because I was really into implants. And then I just took a lot of CE. And then I didn't really do any other fellowships until the past few years. So I was really focused on, you know, implants in the beginning and really just honing my skills, figuring out my type of practice and, you know, what I enjoy, what I don't enjoy. And, you know, that did take a while. And I, I realized that I don't like endo. I don't do any endo and I don't like doing really difficult extractions. And that's just something I found out. Um, so I refer those cases out and, you know, for me, that's really the important thing is, is finding out what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy and staying in your comfort zone. So uh, 
I might ask each of you guys an opinion about um, the future of dentistry. Let's say if we're going back, would we, would you, Eric or Charles, would you consider being a dentist or you just say, maybe I'm doing something else better? What, what would you say to those uh, student dental, uh, like pre-dental student or pre-medical student thinking about dentistry and they go, oh, I'm not sure should I go. I, I, I see Eric write a book about stress-free dentistry. That means dentists must have a lot of problem. I don't know, should I go to dentistry uh, or just avoid all at all costs and and uh, talking about student loan and all of that. So, Can I answer one question real quick? You answered the, I, that was beautiful what you said, Eric, about the whole, um, you know, going back in time and what you do. I think diversifying yourself with multiple types of practice, I think that's beautiful, Eric. I think that's a really good idea. I don't think you should own a practice right away. I think you should learn that. Uh, we we did residency programs. That was huge for me too. That gave me the latitude to understand dentistry a little bit better. Um, I think that's good. I think the Academy, I'm biased on that. Academy of General Dentistry has an awesome fellowship program and, and master's program. I would go on that track. Um, I would also mentor under some really fast, I'd go to mentor and shadow some really good dentists. You know, I think I would do that. And then like even endo, for example, or one of those things that you said, I didn't like that. I, I went right away to Buchanan's course and I took a weekend course with him and at the beginning of my career. And that one weekend course translated to 20 years of knowledge from one weekend because it was amazing, right? So I would invest in that if you can. I know it's expensive. But it's a big investment, so I would do that. Um, invest in that and get join a study group, Eric. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Join a study absolutely. Group. A, a one that you can have colleagues that you can meet with, you can talk to, and you can engage in CE, so you're committed in CE. And I think the type of CE you do is also something that's very important, Eric. Would you agree? Like business versus that, we don't do a lot of business. We don't, but we need to, <laughs> right? Communication. It's huge too, don't you think, Eric, in the office? Oh, Charles, you nailed it. I wish I went back and, you know, I did so much CE about clinical dentistry, but what I was glossing over was taking classes on leadership and speaking 100%. and selling and, yeah. and, and confidence and, you know, presentation skills. Yes. Um, those are just as important as, as clinical skills. You could be the most talented clinician and have the most expensive piece of equipment, but if you can't sell the treatment and, and be confident about it and confidence in your skills, then you're not going to be able to get patients to move forward. So I, I totally agree with you. You got to connect first before you sell. You got to get mm -hmm. a relationship first, not sell first, relationship. And it's not hard to sell. Dentistry is not, it's sending, dentistry is easy to sell, right? But you're right. It's the personality, right? It's the person, right? And it's how you relate to your staff and team. Everything's a secret sauce, all of that above. And I, so I agree 100% with your saying, Eric. 100%, I agree on that. Um, Charles, you also you also mentioned the word mentor, and that is something I, I wish that I had done more early on. I, I did have some great mentors, but going into a, a mentor's office and observing them, even assisting for them is yes. is is gold. Invaluable. Invaluable. Matter of fact, I even went to the dental labs. Mm. I went to the dental labs and I look at other people's work and I'm like, how come all these margins are not capturing? And go, I would have no business otherwise, you know. And it's like it was very humbling to see mm -hmm. that see other people's work. Do we look at other people's work? No, we have no idea. So you have to be not only technical, right, Eric? Mm -hmm. be, by the way, I had guys that were treating the most famous people in my area, and they were not good clinicians. Matter of fact, my staff even told me you cannot work with them anymore. But mm -hmm. they were wonderful people. They were beautiful people. They were such a good connector, but their clinical skills are not good. And someone could be a good clinical person and be a failure in dentistry. They can be technically good, but not connect to people and not be humanistic and not be right. And they'll fail. Would yeah, you the, 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 you strike gold when you can get both or, or at least, you know, try to get both. We can connect with patients and also have, you know, really good clinical skills. That's when you hit a home run. I agree. I totally agree with you guys. Um, so regarding to my question uh, previously, do you feel like, uh, what are the qualifications of a person, a student, or how do they repair themselves to go to dentistry? Because some of the young kids, they might see their parent go into dentistry and they might follow, but or maybe they see the neighbor or the dentist, but and uh, they want to do dentistry, but they don't know what are they stepping in. Would you, each of you guys share with us a little bit of qualification of being a, a dentist in general? whether female or male, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, and Charles, 
you can jump in right after, but I, I, some great advice that I would give is that the only perfect dentist is the one that is not practicing. You know, there's no such thing as the perfect dentist. Not, no. And you know, the, the, the kids that are applying to school or just getting out of school, they are probably the top 1% of their, their classes and yeah. just really just crushing it in the sciences and, and doing well. And they're striving per, for perfection and they're on a, on a track. And when you get out of dental school and you hit the real world and you try to be perfect, that's a one-way street to burnout city. So to, to, to go easy on yourself and understand that there's going to be mistakes and failures and, and that's okay. You know, you learn, you live some, you learn some and you, and you move on. Um, and to not, you know, not beat yourself up when some, something doesn't go exactly how you planned. Agree. Agree. Sure. Anything else you added? Jara, can you hear me? I lost, I lost you for a second. Um, yeah, perfectionism is not, uh, is not unattainable. But we're taught to be that, though, aren't we, Eric? So mm -hmm. it's hard to not be. But, uh, you know, the body's dynamic. You can't control a patient drinking chocolate milk in the middle of the night or not brushing their teeth and expecting or biting on a nut. You can't expect things to not fail. I mean, God gave us perfect teeth, right, or whatever. You can't expect that us to put a big piece of wedge in there and make it's going to be whole. Um, I think going in with the wrong intentions. I think everybody sees the money. It's not the money that drives contentment, right? Fulfillment. Money is only so good, right? It's really what the time we do with the time we are on the earth and the impact. And sometimes that comes later in life. Sometimes that comes earlier in life. But you can have houses. You can have cars, right, Eric, don't you think? You can have everything. You can have all the money in the world and you may not be content. That's so, so true. Go the wrong, wrong, they go in for the wrong intentions. Mm -hmm. so they go in for the right intentions. If you go in that you want to help people, you may want to make a difference. You can help people being, I think, my interview at one of the schools, they said, why don't you just be a, you know, a guy that picks up trash? And, you know, uh, then I said, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like it was a funny question, right? But the reality is, is that everybody contributes in the world, not just, mm -hmm. you know, so we're not higher than now, right? We're just, we're just a small little microcosm in the, in the world here that we contribute to, right? It, and and uh, we can make a significant difference though, but you got to go in with the right purpose and the right intentions and don't go into it for that. It's just getting harder and harder right now. As the corporations come in, and more, more, maybe more, sorry, I don't want to cause any ruffles here, but it becomes more business driven than people driven. It's hard. It's hard to maintain what you go in for. Right. And so, um, there's some challenges ahead. The technology is a challenge. Would you agree, Eric? Learning this technology. And the, the amount of student loans is, is such a so challenge. So coming out with 400. <laughs> yeah. Or crypto yeah. Yeah, that's hard too. You come in with huge debt and everything else. So you have no choice but to work for someone because you can't do both, right? You can't do, unless you're financially wealthy and you hit the lottery or you have someone in the family that can donate all that to you. So my plan is I'm going to have my kids get really good at pickleball. And by the time it becomes a division, ah. then they'll get scholarships. So that, that's oh, yeah. my plan. Nice, nice. I love that. <clears throat> we have a couple of minutes. Uh, Eric, would you share with the young dentists or some of the, some of the dentists that is, are struggling right now with their practice or whether it's the patient related, management related, what are the routine thing that you do uh, before you walk into the office? You Can you share with uh, some wisdom to, for these listeners, like what are the routine thing that you do every single day? You know that's going to be predictable for your, for your, for your schedule, for your for your dentist uh, life, any little thing that you think that it, it helped you? Oh yeah, there's there's so many things that, you know, I, I actually don't look at the schedule the night before. I used to do oh. that and I would I would focus on that one patient and be like, oh, you know, Mrs. <laughs> Johnson's coming in. Uh, but in the morning, my routine is I get up about 5 a.m. and I actually start writing. And I've actually, I was a C plus student in high school in writing. So by no means am I a gifted writer and I just got better at it. And I start in the morning, I start writing and that's, I'm, I'm working on my fourth book uh, called Next Level, uh, Stress-Free ne Next Level Dentistry. And that's kind of my way of just getting into my zone. And I feel like I get so much accomplished before I even, you know, go to the office. And then I go to the office and again, I, I try not to uh, put too much pressure on myself if a patient you know, cancels or, or doesn't rebook. I, I don't beat myself up. If a patient doesn't move forward with treatment and I gave it my best, then, then that's okay. But 
you know, there's going to be some days where you just, you get home and you just saw 27 patients and you're exhausted. Uh, and that's going to happen. And that, and that's okay. Um, but if these days are happening more than often, and you seem like they, they're, they're continuing and that's when it's time to really, you know, dive in and, and get some help. Um, but I, another thing that I do is I stand, I don't sit down anymore. Mm-hmm. I've totally removed all my, my operatory, uh, stools, uh, and that's really helped my back and I'm constantly stretching throughout the day and I no longer have uh, much back pain or, uh, neck pain. And I also use an isolation device. So, uh, and also very important, make the patient move their head, you know, where you need their head to go. Uh, because we're holding that position for, you know, for, you know, for 30 years, they're holding that position for 30 minutes. So do what it takes to, to get your body, um, right. Because if you're physically in pain, you're, you're not going to be mentally happy. So, you know, take care of your body, take care of your mind. That's very viable information you just gave that Eric. And I can, I can personally sympathize with that myself doing five hour, four hour full mouth case of sedation and just big rack baking same stagnant spot, you know, get loops that are now they have the loop. Now you can look up and uh, mic- ended on south of the microscope, which gives them that latitude, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I think stretching, yoga, massage therapy, regular. And then Eric, going back in time, would you say you'd work? I don't know, when you started out, I worked out doing six days a week. Would you say perhaps maybe you should take that four days and take that one day to rejuvenate more a week? I and mean, if you can do it and consolidate and take more time off, would you, Absolutely. Intentionally, would you intentionalize your vacations and recharge your batteries? Absolutely. You'd probably be more productive, wouldn't you? Looking back, you know looking back in time, think about it. I've, I've actually gone down to about three and a half days a week, and I'm more productive than I was when I was six days a week. You know, when I first got out. Yeah, it seems it seems like uh, we all do the same now. You know, after uh, two decades of practicing, uh, maybe three day, uh, three day and a half would be the best for everyone. And uh, uh, your 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 advice is wonderful or wonderful for um, the listener about changing position. Um, don't worry too much about the patient. If there is a difficult patient or a cancellation patient, just uh, use that time to do something that you 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 want to do to repair for the next day or for your uh, side, side work. And uh, I like that you uh, start focus on writing the book. Is there any kind of uh, principle value of uh, how you find out like you, okay you you got the core value that you know that you can just continue writing the certain book based on certain principle uh, is there anything that you can share with us or that could be okay if you don't want to share with that too you know like i mentioned i was not a, by any means gifted at writing and i just worked at it and got better and i just i write about my experiences and my stories and that's really all i know and i have uh contributors come in and, and give um, quotes and, and and paragraphs. And that's really kind of, you know, just my style. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, I, I started different websites and, and different brands and, and organizations. And that those side gigs or side hustles have tremendously helped my full hustle, which is dentistry. Mm. You know, I, you know, like I mentioned, if a patient cancels, I'm like, okay, cool. I'll go work on something else. So having other things than just dentistry has been so helpful to my dental career. Yeah, balance. I agree. I agree. This is, that's exactly what I do. And, uh, you know, like, you know, I'm in South California, Charo in Southern California, and you are in Boston, and we still can connect together and do, do something like this. And your, your daughter, your son, you know, look up this uh, video in the next five year or mm-hmm. uh, whenever they are ready for dental career, they go like, oh, daddy doing something. Let's check out daddy, you know, <laughs> see what's going on. You know, at least we don't have to leave. Uh, uh, yeah, we do give give some, uh, some you know, wealth for them, but the kids in the legacy, something that behind, yeah. this is forever, you know, the internet here. system is forever. So it's not going to be destroyed and let Google disappear, YouTube disappear. But uh, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, uh, Charo, for being in this podcast today. Appreciate your time. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, though. All right. Take care, yeah. you guys. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Have a